What is up, everybody? Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack-A-Day Podcast. I am incredibly excited to be joined today by the one and only Brad Spielberger. You can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Brad. You can find him on Over the Cap. You can find him on Pro Football Focus. He is, in my opinion, the foremost expert on all things NFL salary cap. He is somebody that when I'm confused by a contract or a salary cap issue, or I just get really bored of like going through... Uh, CBA materials. I go to Brad and he has pretty much every answer known to man. So Brad, thank you. And welcome into the pack a day podcast. Yeah, of course. That's what I'm, that's what I'm here for. And uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. So I want to go through a variety of different topics today. Obviously the green Bay Packers have entered into some interesting contracts this off season. Want to discuss those with you. Probably our main topic is going to kind of be that Jordan love upcoming contract. Really interesting to interested to hear your take on that. And I know you're a Bears fan too, so I might have to ask you a couple Bears questions as well. But before we get to all that, let's start with some of those contracts because the Packers made a pretty big splash in free agency. They go get arguably the top safety on the market in Xavier McKinney. They make a big time acquisition. It's a really interesting contract for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one, it was a pretty stacked slash loaded safety market. And you look at Xavier McKinney's contract and it is well above anything anyone else got, but he is the premium player at the position. So I'll let you just start there. Your your thoughts on the overall contract in Green Bay signing Xavier McKinney. Yeah, no, he was the best safety available. No question about it. You know, a top 40 pick for a reason. A guy that can play all over the field. Uh, you saw last year down in the box making plays. Obviously, we know he's a ball hawk. Good, uh, you know, spatial awareness, good range, closing ability, uh, and turned the ball over a bunch last season. And, and yeah, there are some safeties obviously that didn't do quite as well. I think you and I talked Cam Curl, who obviously signed a very small, you know, two-year, $9 million deal. You do see, though, those, those premier safeties are still getting paid. It's really that second tier, that middle tier that's getting pinched, and all those guys now are kind of getting smaller contracts. And obviously, the Packers viewed McKinney in that upper echelon, but without having to go, you know, 18, 19-plus type of money. So I think it's a good deal. I, I think it was obviously probably the biggest weakness on the roster last year, certainly on the short list. I think you, you'd probably agree with that. So yeah, yeah. Brian Gutekunst makes another splash for a young player, a good player, and a guy that can do a lot and bring a lot of different skills to this defense. So let's talk about the contract a little bit. Four years, 67 million. It's a pretty standard Packers-esque contract and fairly common of what's sort of being done around the league. You've got a 1.5 basically million base salary his first year, 2.7, 4.2, and then 14.6 in that final season. I think the big roster bonuses in year two and year three at 8.5 million a piece are probably ones that when you get to that point are probably key restructure pieces if they want to open up some salary cap space down the road. And then you've got that 5.75 million signing bonus that's split up or you know, each each year it's 5.75 million over four years. You've got some roster bonuses, some workout bonuses, things like that. But anything surprise you structurally or any key takeaways from the structure of this deal? Yeah, you know, I think like you said, it, it's fairly standard Packers, only guaranteed money, obviously, in that signing bonus. But the flip side or, or kind of the concession you make then is players want that assurance. All right, on March you know, 15th, I'm getting an $8.5 million roster bonus. So there's protection or you know whatever you want to call it for the player as well. Yeah. I think I may have mentioned this on many po Packers podcasts, but they also retain players. Uh, them, the Steelers, the Bengals, the teams that do these structures also historically – keep players further into their deal than any other team in the NFL. So they're not trying to sign these deals and then quickly get out of them. They understand, all right, we're going to not give you guaranteed money in later years, but you're probably going to stay on this roster longer uh, than most other players. So yeah, fa fairly straightforward. The third year roster bonus, a nice little you know payday for McKinney. And like you said, if they got to restructure it, maybe add some void years, whatever. We know now in, in recent years, they're comfortable doing that. Yeah, very much so. Not something previously that they did a lot of more recently, past few seasons. Uh, it is something that they have not been afraid to pull the trigger on whatsoever. Let's go to Josh Jacobs next. Obviously, one of the more interesting aspects of this Packers offseason is moving on from Aaron Jones. We'll talk about A.J. Dillon in just a bit, but then going and getting Josh Jacobs on that opening day of free agency. Another interesting contract here. This one probably a little bit more I don't know if we just want to call it get outable over the course of after year one, year two, then maybe Xavier McKinney's is um, they're going to have some options after this, but your thoughts on the signing and then sort of thoughts on the contract as well. 
Yeah, you know, I think it was interesting. Some people were a bit surprised by it. And I know some things are rumors, some things are, are true. But there was a lot of, you know, buzz that the Packers were one of the teams maybe talking to the Colts when it looked like Jonathan Taylor could have been available. So it's not super surprising to me. They go out and make a splash there. And like you said, this is pretty much the same as Jones, where it's a two-year deal. And then even if not an outright cut, you go to the player for a pay cut and you say, Go look at the running back market. And unfortunately, the odds that you do better than, let's say, after two years, we're going to pay you $10.2 million in salary. We want to cut that in half. When you're a 28, 29-year-old running back, you might not get $5 million, you know, even in the first year of a deal. Obviously, Jones got one year six from Minnesota with some upside there. But So it is structured in that manner, and they'll have those outs or those kind of leverage points, so to speak, from the team side. Look, I mean, he's a dynamic player. He also can catch the ball out of the backfield. I feel like he did that less in Las Vegas than he did at Alabama. Dynamic athlete. He's a good pass protector as well. Uh, I think he adds a, a critical element to this offense. How important is it? You know, we can almost kind of juxtapose this a little bit with some of what the Bears did. They were willing to go and get some older players, and we can kind of discuss this a little bit more later too, but they they are happy to get a, a Keenan Allen, um, Gerald Everett, who's a little bit on the older side, obviously a Kevin Byard, um, and then I, I think a similar age for probably DeAndre Swift uh, that, uh, that Josh Jacobs is. But for the Packers, it seems they very much prioritized age within this as well. Specifically, if you look at the running back position, going from an older Aaron Jones to a younger Josh Jacobs and then Xavier McKinney, uh, turns 25 this off season. Uh, he is going to be in the prime of his career. I know that's part of the premium that you pay for getting McKinney at this point in his career as well, but it definitely seemed that green Bay wanted to keep players that were sort of on their current timeline with where their other players, star players are on, on the team right now. Yeah. I think you also pay a little bit of premium for getting the four year deal for McKinney. You know, we've seen across the entire NFL, the average term length of deals dramatically fell off a cliff this offseason. We already seen inklings, you know, last offseason, all those wide receivers signing those three-year extensions, and it varies position to position. But now we have guards signing three-year extensions across the NFL. That had been a sticky one where it was always four or five years for that spot. So you are, if you're getting that fourth year of control, again, safety is not quite running back, but there's a pretty steep drop off there for a lot of talent too. You hit 30 and, and you're kind of old at that spot. The trenches, you can last a little bit longer. So yeah, you pay a little bit more, but you get that fourth year of control from the team side. It's funny you mentioned the Bears. Like they have been, if you were like over 25, like you're not even like on their board uh, until this off season. Now, of course, they're, they're sprinkling in some veteran talent, trying to build out a better you know, infrastructure for a quarterback. But yeah, I think they usually generally view it the same way. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I want to ask you, though, you, you mentioned those three-year contracts. In your opinion, is that teams more wanting to go shorter deals and not commit longer to players? Or is that players, and we see this very much in the NBA as well, but we're starting to see players maybe wanting to get lesser contracts so they can get another big contract down the line? Or is it something in the middle? No, it's player driven, I would say 99%, right? Because for a team, from a team perspective, if the money is not guaranteed in those later years, it, it doesn't really exist. So yeah. it, I think, you know, Andrew Brandt obviously worked for the Packers. I think he's tweeted before, like they'd sign you to a hundred year contract. They don't care because the money is not guaranteed to you. So no, you're seeing players and agents pushing for that because like exactly like you said, another bite at the apple, get one more substantial deal when you're in your late twenties, not when you're 30. Um, and, and now we're seeing that league wide. Uh, makes a ton of sense. Let's go over to Keyshawn Nixon. This is one of the ones that I think caught my eye a little bit, probably a little bit more at the onset than maybe I was expecting. The more I've sort of come to terms with it, I think it makes a little bit more sense, especially with the kick return rules that were just uh, changed. And you obviously have the all first team all pro returner from the past two seasons on your roster. Now uh, it's a three-year deal. It's $18 million overall. Um, this is another one where probably towards the end of it, you have some potential to get out of it specifically in that third year. Uh, but your thoughts on the three year, $18 million deal for Keyshawn Nixon. Yeah, I think I had it at five. So I guess it came in a little bit higher than I expected. Yeah. Right, right. But I think it, it aged very well for two reasons. So first, like you mentioned, I mean, look, it's not even a joke. Like the kickoff thing changing and making it more of an actual component of football is a great benefit for the Packers having Keyshawn Nixon. But also I think they probably were privy to Kenny Moore going to reset the market with 10 million. And then shortly thereafter, Teron Johnson and Buffalo gets like 10.1. But you know, they knew the market was going to grow. And that slot corner market had not grown since 2019. Justin Coleman signed a 9 million per year deal in Detroit. Um, you know, in terms of like a true slot corner, not a guy that kicks inside. So I think now it's aged very well for both of those reasons. He's a good player. Um, I think he got better and better in the slot, particularly as well. When I was doing film study for him, um, you know, going into free agency, I liked a lot of what I saw. And then, of course, you know, the return ability is important. 
Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I thought as the season progressed, and it's it's tough to remember sometimes. That was really his first year as a starter at, at the nickel spot. And I thought as the season went on, he acquitted himself well. Obviously, had that huge interception against Patrick Mahomes to steal the game and then steal the game. Excuse me, and then or steal maybe. Um, but uh, then also, you know, like you said, the, the kick return ability. To me, when you bunch that all in and and just the flexibility he gives you on a 48 man game day roster to be a core special teamer, a nickel corner, a guy that can you know be even got a gadget spot on offense, the kick return to the punt returner, just all of it, you start breaking it down. It's like, all right, it's probably worth it to have that guy in your roster. Especially because we actually saw a, a little bit of a growth in some of those special teams contracts too. And not even just guys that return punts, but you know, gunners or, or guys that are just core 300 snap type players on special teams, that market had a little bit of an upward bump, a, an upward adjustment too. So it kind of is all in line with the growth we saw for all the different facets of play he impacts. And as soon as that kick return rule changed, we saw Cordero Patterson immediately go off the market too. So yeah, it's probably only going to go up from there. And like you said, that, that contract probably gets better with age. And the last one I wanted to uh, just talk about really briefly is AJ Dillon. Green Bay gets him back. Um, it's a really interesting situation. They use the four year player qualifying contract, which is of course, everyone's favorite contract. Um, they get him back on what's really a super team friendly deal. It's basically a vet minimum for the Packers, but Dylan gets, what is it? 2.57 million. Um, actually paid out to him. Packers obviously have to pay that all, but it just, they get a salary cap benefit from that. It's a very minimal signing bonus, 167,500. So in my opinion, they get to training camp and maybe they take a couple running backs or some undrafted guy completely blows it out of the water. If they're like, hey, we have three better running backs than AJ, they can still get out of this pretty easily. Um, this just seems to make very logical sense as an option for Green Bay. It does. That's actually the maximum signing bonus you're allowed to give to still qualify for the four-year qualifying contract. And that's kind of because of what you just talked about, right? You still have flexibility. If they don't, if the draft doesn't go their way, potentially, obviously people don't seem to love the running back class as is, then he, he stays. He can be, you know, it sounds like I saw a report this morning. Maybe there's more, um, you know, H-back, fullback type roles and different elements to, to what he does. Um, and then if not, still, it's not a bad deal. Uh, you get the cap benefit, the cap relief. Obviously, cash matters more, but it certainly helps. Um, and, and obviously, he's an important piece of the locker room and all those things, too. Uh, and it, it's definitely not a, a huge expenditure. No, it's really not. Just gives them flexibility and options. And as a GM, that's sort of built into your DNA of what you want to do is give yourself outs and give yourself uh, different flexibility uh, to be able to do things during the course of a season. Uh, let's move over to that Jordan Love contract because in an interesting offseason where the Packers get an entirely new defense, a new defensive coordinator, move on from Aaron Jones, sign Xavier McKinney, Josh Jacobs, all the guys we just discussed. It's a pretty epic offseason from Green Bay standards already arguably the most epic thing that they're going to do probably this entire offseason is sign Jordan Love to what is expected to be a massive contract. Before we jump into what maybe those numbers could look like or what you're expecting, the Packers are always in like this unprecedented sort of situation where there's not a lot of teams that do what the Packers do. There's not a lot of teams that draft and develop a quarterback, let him sit for three years, have him take over, and then all of a sudden he takes over and he's really freaking good right away. Um, there's just not a lot of situations where that happens. And really, it's just Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love as of late. I can't think of really any other. So is there any other precedents to sort of go off of as you start building a contract for Jordan Love this offseason? I think the interesting thing here, too, is that also the timeline with Aaron Rodgers, for example, you know, you had longer rookie contracts. There weren't fifth year option decisions after the third sure. season. So more dynamics that make it harder to do this now. The only other one I can think of, and it's not a clean example, but it's Steve Young. Like there was sort of that where he didn't really play. Obviously, drafted to Tampa, then goes to San Fran, but sits for a while, signs like a kind of a bridge two year type of deal, just like a Jordan Love. And then in his first year as a starter, puts up great numbers and signs a pretty substantial deal. So it's not quite the same thing, but I think it's fairly similar. Drew Brees, also not a great comparison, but there's sort of some similarities there too. And then sure. you very quickly say, okay, this is our guy and he's a top of market type of player, uh, which is where we're at again in Green Bay. Yeah, it definitely seems that way. So let, let, I'll let you put your, um, you know, Russ Ball hat on for a second and you're starting to do a contract and contract negotiations with Jordan Love and his agents. What are you, you know, what are you starting at? Like, what are you hoping to get out of it? Are you looking for length? Are you looking for guarantees? Are you looking for size of, con like, I know all of it goes into it, but how do you start sort of building that structure for this contract? 
Yeah, from the team side, you're going to try as hard as you can to do the five-year deal, right? It's obviously been a precedent across the board for most positions, and, you know, across the Packers, but also other teams. Internally, they want to extend their players, especially the homegrown guys, to as long of a deal as possible. So that's going to be the main priority, especially at quarterback, where every single offseason, that market's always going to grow and grow and grow. The more years of control that you can have, the better it is for the team. And you're willing to make some concessions because you just know the market is going – to new heights every single year. So my guess would be that's where they really try to push it. And then they are going to bend on some precedents. Obviously, Aaron Rodgers, a quarterback, it's a different structure than every other non-quarterback on the roster. Um, but probably try not to, you know, maybe guarantee the first two years, but not the third year if you can. Like, those are going to be the battles, too. How much can Jordan Love push to say, like, this is a different deal. I don't care that you guys don't guarantee money outside the first year. I'm a franchise quarterback. I'm going to need that to happen. Those will be the two, I, I would assume, biggest fights at the, at the outset. So let me start. There's so many different directions I want to go with this, but from a Packers standpoint, like where do you mitigate risk of like, Hey, he was awesome, but he was awesome for like a half a season. Like we saw him really take off in the second half of the year. Let's say, I don't think this is going to be the case, but let's say his agent and him are more like, Hey, let's do some Patrick Mahomes esque deal. We want some super long term. If you're the Packers, are you somewhat nervous of entering into something like that? Because Hey, we only saw it for half a year. Like, does Green Bay want to structure it where like they have some outs here too? Or is Green Bay thrilled if they can get some even longer term deal with more, you know, um stability down the line with Jordan Love? Because this is a sort of interesting situation there as well. So Mahomes specifically uh, is probably the most team-friendly contract that will ever be signed in the history of the NFL. So yeah. not even just the 10 years, which obviously is a big part of it, but the early year cash flows were super, super low compared to the market. The thing there, though, is then the, that what Kansas City did in his favor was the rolling guarantee. So then you're talking about, you know, it is a couple of years out ahead, but you're guaranteeing money seven, eight years down the line. So Green Bay might say, OK, if we do that, though, we saw in Pittsburgh recently where they were the same thing. Only quarterbacks, only Big Ben got a different contract. But T.J. Watt said, no, enough. I'm going to get guaranteed money in later years of a deal as a non quarterback. And then Minka Fitzpatrick followed up you know, uh, the following offseason. So. It's kind of that balance again, but yeah, I mean, if I'm Russ Ball in Green Bay, if they're open to that structure, which they're not, yeah. uh, you know, I, I would do it in a heartbeat. All right. So we kind of looked at this from a Packers side, and I know you kind of uh, put a couple of those uh, things in there already from a Jordan Love side, but you're Jordan Love and his agents. What are you sort of looking for? I'm, I'm assuming probably a little bit of a shorter deal, more guarantees. That's probably going to be on the, the top of their, their wish list. Yeah, so I am pushing for a four-year deal, and you know this is a group that has done some of the four-year extensions. Dak Prescott, and, and it's all one massive agency, not the same agent, but and obviously Aaron Rodgers got a four-year extension. Was at 2018, so they're probably pushing for that one. I think it does benefit the Packers that you know the Joe Burrows, the Justin Herberts, that they they had to go to five. There's kind of been this this ebb and flow back and forth where it was like Goff, Wentz, Dak, all four. Then you had the ten and the six, ten being Mahomes, six being Josh Allen. So now we're back to five. Um, you know, and again, this agency did Justin Herbert. So I, I think they would try to go four years it is the main, main thing. And you still work with the, the Packers structure. So, you know, pretty massive signing bonus, probably, I don't know, 60 plus million dollar yeah. signing bonus, even on a four year deal. Um, and I'm sure Green Bay fights tooth and nail to go to five. Yeah, that'd be my guess as well. If you had a guess, and I know this is a, a tough thing maybe to predict, but what are we looking at here? You know, five years, 250 million. Are we looking in the 50 million per range? Um, you know, how much guaranteed? Like, where do you sort of expect this to kind of equal out as these two sides sort of battle things out in negotiations this offseason? Yeah, I'm not just saying this as, as a Bears fan that hopes uh, last season was a mirage, but no, I, right. I, I think 50 is, a, I wouldn't even call it a floor. I think above 50 might be the floor yeah. of this deal. And I know that sounds crazy, but with where the market's going to go, I know there was reports yesterday about Dak Prescott and the Cowboys not talking, not really buying it. I think they'll get there eventually. You have Tua Tagovailoa, who I know is not viewed in this great light, but I mean, he puts up massive numbers when he stays healthy, he stayed healthy the whole year. Um, he's going to get above 50. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, maybe Jacksonville tries to wait. They probably shouldn't. They'll get above 50. So all of a sudden, very quickly, you're sitting there and like, it's just where the market's going to go. You know, I would say if, I, if it is five years, like you're getting into the, the Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow range, if not more. So 53 yeah. and a half, 55, you know, if not, maybe a little bit above that. Um, but maybe, maybe it stays around there. Maybe you're not resetting the market, but you're coming pretty close. Yeah, I think so too. I think five years, 53 to 55 million per season. I think the, always the super interesting. And we you talk about Dak and, and two on some of those guys. 
what, what you're you're always battling is the alternative. Like not having a quarterback is just death in the NFL. You're you're just in complete no man's land, and that's why we see even sometimes you know marginal quarterbacks get bigger deals because again the alternative is just a nightmare. And when you're Green Bay and you move up in the draft to go get Jordan Love while Aaron Rodgers is there, you trade away the face of the franchise in Aaron Rodgers. And then he goes out and plays at such a high level in his very first season, even if it was more towards the second half of the season. Th again, there's no alternative here. You're just going to pay him whatever the the sort of market bearing contract is. And to your point that the Joe Burrow, the, the Justin Herbert type deals is where that's at. And that's only going to go up as the cap continues to expand. And I think the big thing here is, and I get why you know fans view it this way or think of it this way, of this thing, hey, look, it's only been a year. That's not Jordan Love's fault. And, and if I'm right. his rep, I'm saying I could have demanded a trade. I could have caused problems. I could have been a headache. And as far as we know, none of that happened. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's like, again, I, I get I get your concern from, from the team side of like, we, we want to see more. We want to buy in. That's not really my problem. We chose to go with your approach. We stuck it out. And like we're talking about the top of the show, it's not really a thing anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's the thing. Is they're like, you know, boo-hoo, so sorry that, that, you're, that you're afraid, but that's that's just not our concern. And Brian Gudikins just answered this question a couple of days ago as well, basically the same thing. And you know, what Brian said basically is like, hey, yeah, he only played for the year, but we've seen him for four years. We know who he is. We know what he's about. We know what work ethic he has. So, you know, they're very confident that I think Jordan is going to be this quarterback or hopefully even better uh, from a Packer side of things moving forward. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. And by the way, like uh, Jordan Love, Caleb Williams, by the way, like uh, rivalry going forward. If that pans out, that could be really freaking fun. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. We, we talked about Packer side of things. We talked about Jordan Love side of things. From a Packer fan side of things, what should fans kind of be like hoping for when this deal sort of gets done? I know obviously like less money, longer year, like, but in a realistic sort of frame, what should Packer fans be kind of looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think really just getting getting it done, getting a five-year deal, I, I think would be a win um, in, in that range we talked about. And I think the big thing for me is I would also argue if on their side, his entire pass catching core last season was rookies or second year players. He had two young tackles. Yeah, they played well. Yeah, all the pass catchers you know played well too. But like the sky is like it, it could be even better. And you mentioned Daniel Jones. Jordan Love already has done more in a season than Daniel Jones has ever done by yeah. an order of magnitudes, right? So you've already seen a lot. And I'm not saying Jones had a good offensive line or good pass catchers. He didn't, but you get a healthy Christian Watson back. You get continued gro growth from Jaden Reed, Dontavian Wicks, the tight ends, all of these things. You know, Rasheed Walker and, and and Zach Tom play better. Like, you really, you could say what you just saw was the floor. You could make that argument. It might not be true, but you really could, uh, like, you know, make that argument and, and not really be, you know, totally full of it. So I think if you're a Packer fan, you just hope it gets done, period. You want that five year term and it'll look big at first. But as we know, in two years, he'll be like a fringe top 10 paid quarterback. It's just how it goes in the NFL. And uh, I, like, I, I think that contract will age very well, no matter what ends up happening for Green Bay, as long as Jordan Love continues to progress the way that he has been progressing. All right, a couple of quick hitters before we get you out of here. I think this one is probably relatively simple, but the Packers have a decision coming up, a fifth-year option on Eric Stokes. I know for PFF, uh, I believe it was you went over yeah. all the different fifth year options and who will get picked up and who will not get picked up. Um, and you had Eric Stokes not getting picked up, which I agree with, but like I said, this seems like a fairly easy decision. It, I guess you, you could certainly frame it that way. I, I think it was one of the tougher ones in the article, yeah. just because some of them are super obvious in either direction. I think it leans that way. And I know again, Gutekunst mentioned this past week, like they feel confident about their cornerback room. I'm kind of sitting there thinking that could be a, a first round option for them. Potentially. I like some of the players in the class some positional versatility, Agreed. some different skill sets too. So I think it probably will lean that way. And again, we talked about the retention of players like green Bay, the way they're able to get pay cuts or is because they are genuine where it's like, Hey, look, we're going to decline it. But if you have a good fourth year, We'll talk mid-season even, potentially. I don't know if they don't do business mid-season, but I think they do. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, we'll get something done. We, we still believe in the talent. We drafted in the first round for a reason. But yeah, it, gun to my head, I probably would say they declined. And I, to your point, I will say I didn't necessarily expect them to pick up Darnell Savage's fifth year option, right. and they did that as well. So they have surprised me with this situation in the past. I just think based on his overall health the past couple seasons, his play on the field in the two seasons, even when he was rarely on the field, I, my guess is they just go, you know, I think they feel confident about Carrington Valentine. I agree with you. I'd be surprised if in the first three rounds, they don't end up with a corner in this draft as well to continue to compete at that position. But we'll see. It, maybe it ends up being a more interesting decision than maybe I'm thinking it is, but that is one that they'll have to make this off season. Um, and then just kind of like a general overall salary cap health question for Green Bay. 
Uh, I know over the cap has them at about 22 million right now in salary cap space. In 2025, they're listed at 68.7, but it like so much is going to change with the love contract and just between now and then that it's probably not even worth looking at that number too much. But just in general, your overall feeling of the Packers salary cap health. Yeah, the, the thing is what they always do to balance it is they have 11 draft picks and, and five in the top 100. And we just talked about the entire offense besides Jordan Love and a couple other pieces are on these rookie deals. So not spending on all their receivers and tight ends and offensive linemen besides Elton Jenkins. There's so much savings there. And obviously move on from Devondre Campbell and, and some of the pricier players you had on defense. Trading Rasul Douglas, which, by the way, for a third-round pick, has aged phenomenally. He's a good player, but you know, same trade comp as Legereus Sneed. Quite a, quite a trade. So they, they'll be fine. Yes, it's, it, we are in an era right now where they've had to you know push money out, like we talked about, add void years, do a lot of crazy things. Even with the Jordan Love contract kicking in, because they have true, legit contributors at so many spots on rookie contracts, and they always will be draft and develop, they're fine. I'm with you. I'm excited about what they have. And I think it's your point, especially like the wide receiver position where you've got a really good wide receiver core and two tight ends and you're paying them like $10 million total on all those contracts. Like that is an enviable position to be in. And Green Bay is going to have some flexibility because of that until all those contracts come up at the same time. And then they're going to have probably some very interesting decisions to make. All right, as they say, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. I know you do follow the Chicago Bears and are a Bears fan as well. Uh, we won't hold that against you, uh, but obviously I have to ask you, this is a very epic offseason, I think for the NFC North in general, when you have the Chicago Bears having the number one pick in the draft in a draft where there's so many great quarterbacks, at least theoretically, and, and somebody like Caleb Williams at the top of it. They're aggressive in free agency. The Vikings, in all likelihood, are probably going to move up and go get a quarterback. Like the, the the Jordan Love contract and what Green Bay's done in free agency, even some of the nice moves that Detroit has done. Like this is going to have a long term effect on the NFC North. What happens this off season? But from a Bears side of things, Caleb Williams, number one overall in all likelihood, and then obviously they still have that number nine pick as well. Um, just how excited are you? And what have been some of your favorite moves of this off season for Chicago so far? Yeah, no, I'm pumped. And I think that you just have such a better infrastructure in place to bring in a rookie quarterback. I mean, to be picking first overall when I know your own picks nine, it's not like you're picking 20th, but you know, you don't have a first overall pick roster, right? Even before you add yeah. a Keenan Allen, you know, DeAndre Swift, et cetera, uh, bring in a couple centers that I think are either one's a starter, one's a good swing IOL, like they added swing tackle help. Like they're just doing a lot of smart things to just make sure, even with injuries and everything that happens in the NFL. Caleb's not going to have anything in the same stratosphere as what Justin Fields had to deal with in his first two seasons. So I'm super excited. Obviously, I'm a Bears fan, so I'm cautiously optimistic. I, you know, a small part of my brain thinks Caleb Williams is going to be a bust and, and stink because um, I root for a team that's never had a 4,000-yard passer or a 30-touchdown passer. Um, right. but, but all jokes aside, I really do think they are set up very well. Um, look, Ryan Poles has had some massive misses. Chase Claypool happened, but I think he knows what he's doing. I think he understands what he's trying to accomplish. Um, and yeah, the ninth pick too. I mean, get a premium tackle, receiver, pass rusher. Uh, both of those picks, I think, could be foundational cornerstone type players. Yeah, thank you, Ryan Poles, for saving the Packers from that Chase Claypool <laughs> trade. By the way, that was a heck of an assist. So thank you very much for that. But no, I, I'm with you. I, you know, Caleb Williams for me is very much in the Justin Jefferson where I'm like, oh come on, that guy has to go in the division. I love that guy, and he's so amazing. Why do now do I have to cheer against him for the probably remainder of his career? He's a phenomenal player. I'm excited to watch him play in the NFL. And he should be, like you said, like if, if we get a Jordan Love, Caleb Williams, two great quarterbacks in the division battling back and forth for the, the, the NFC North moving forward, that's good for the NFL. That's going to be really fun football. And as much as I'm a Packer fan and you're a Bear fan, I know we're both fans of the NFL and, and that stuff can be really fun as well. Um, last but not least, uh, before we get you out of here, any, any other salary cap trends, rule changes, things that you've seen, anything the Packers have done, things that have happened in the NFC North, just anything that sort of either caught you off guard, surprised you, or maybe that we should be talking about that we're not? Maybe not, not caught me off guard necessarily, but I do wonder with the Jordan Love deal if they are open to some option bonuses and, and to approaching structurally different. We're seeing it now. Some teams are doing it with quarterbacks. Some teams like Cleveland are doing it in every single contract. The Eagles, the same boat. You effectively just build in a restructure like ahead of time. And, and we had the Aaron Rodgers example where I'm sure people remember they ended up switching it to a massive roster bonuses, pushed it a year later, and the Jets dealt with that. But it's kind of a, a manipulation and a circumventing of the cap a little bit because 
The money does prorate ahead of time, but you can still get cap relief and get that money back if you were to move on from the player, if you hadn't paid it already. So sure, I, I wonder if the Packers do maybe get into that, the weeds a little bit there with the option bonus structure for a Jordan Love deal. We do see Russ Ball get rather creative with some of those contracts when he's in some of those situations. So that would not surprise me whatsoever. Brad, thank you so much for doing this. This was super educational. Like I said, I always learn something, whether I'm picking your brain on, on Twitter or whether you know we have the opportunity. This is the first time, but the, obviously the opportunity to do something like this. Um, for our listeners, I know Brad just put out a article on Pro Football Focus, uh, six first round trades that we want to see. And just spoiler alert, there is a Green Bay Packers trade on there. So make sure to go and check that out. But Brad, anything else you'd like to plug on the way out? I just want to know, did you like that trade or no? I did. I think that I'll just, without spoiling too much, I think the third round next year might be a little rich for my blood, but overall the direction and everything. Yes. Uh, I, I very much can get on board with it. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at, at PFF underscore Brad and, and all my content coming out of PFF.com. And also uh, I, I still do work at over the cap.com. So any contract questions, anything like that, uh, you, you can find the answer at OTC. If ever you want to know any contract stuff, go over to Over the Cap. They always do such a tremendous job breaking down every single one of those contracts. And make sure to follow Brad at PFF underscore Brad, even though it is a little you know bears-ish sometimes. Uh, he does <laughs> such a tremendous job covering everything else that is by far worth it. Uh, thanks so much again, Brad, for everyone listening. Uh, you, of course, can find the podcast at Packaday Podcast. You can find me at Andy Herman NFL. That's going to do it for us today. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.